Ana Maria, I would like to start asking you about what is, what do we need to know now, these days, in these strange times that we are all living in? Okay, thank you for the invitation. Hello, Andre. Nice to see you. Hi. And yes, we are um, facing the end of what I call the factory model of the school. Mm -hmm. It's coming to an end, uh, a model that was based on um, having all the knowledge inside one place and only one place where you can learn the classroom. Everyone learning the same thing at the same time with the same teacher and the same books. And that is something that, that, that is becoming to change, not only because of the pandemic, but also because of the time that we are living now, the 21st century, that needs exactly the opposite, needs diversity, needs the space for everyone to learn in their own pace, in their own, with their own abilities. Some kids are more, uh, for example, uh, open to emotions, open to um, creativity, others are more, uh, focus on math, and we need to do that uh, in a more uh, in a, a in a learning environment, which is more than a school. So the first idea is that we are ending what we call the factory model of a school, and this strange time that we are living now due to the pandemic, but also because of the changes that we have in society, is giving us the opportunity to embrace. Uh, one idea that I think is very uh, important today, the notions that emotions are part of our learning journey. They have become center in this moment of the, of the, not only the year, but this strange situation. We are understanding that the way we manage our, our emotions, either if they are positive or negative, will be will determine our learning experience. Also, we are learning that um, the way we, we learn and we can be educated is with others. We learn from others and we learn with others. And it doesn't matter if you are in a virtual space, in, in a Zoom situation like this one, having the panel in the other side of the, or, or, or of the screen or not, but the thing is that we are um, more aware of the importance of having those links uh, and ties. And also, we need to learn uh, in this technological and very digital environment. And that doesn't mean only to understand how to use computers. We don't want to become a second class robots. We want to become a first class humans. And that means we have to understand what is the purpose of the technology? How algorithms are shaping our future and our decisions? So it's knowing about technology, but to use it in our development. Well, I couldn't agree more with that idea of being first-class humans and not second-class robots. So I think it's a, <laughs> it's a fantastic idea. I will present Ana Maria Rad. She's an anthropologist with more than 20 years of leading innovations on social development, education and culture. She is also a member of the National Council of Arts, Cultures and Heritage from the Ministry of Culture in Chile. She recently found Reimagina to promote educational and creative programs to accelerate innovation. I want to ask Andre Stern, what do we need to know to learn now in these strange times? And before that, I want to tell a few things about Andre. He's an author, he's a musician, he's a lecturer, and he's many other things. In 2009, he published the book, I Never Went to a School, which is based on his own experience. He never went to school. He's an, an unschooled um, expert, we could say. Andre, um, what do we need to know now? Oh, a lot of things. <laughs> we, knew, we need to know, I think, more than ever, that we know nothing. And I think that will that will change a lot if we if we agree on that. 
Uh, I think good science is the science which uh, tells us um, the more we know, the less we understand, or the more we understand, the less we know. Um, what we need is is, is some, something very... We need to know how we learn. We need to know how children learn. We need to know how children are, how they work, uh, how our brain works. All of that are the things we need to know before we try to teach someone and before we try to, to, to imagine the, the future. I'll give you uh, one short example. Um, I don't think um, we need new methods. Methods are methods. Um, what we need is a new attitude, a new way of, of meeting, of encountering the child. Children are giants. And that is something we forgot um, because all, uh, of all those habits we have. We have the habit of thinking children are little things, needing our help to grow and become big. Um, and that is the way we thought the world would be. And we thought uh, we have to teach them, otherwise they won't raise. And we developed a whole, us, a, a whole system and, and concepts and ideas about what children should learn, what we should learn, what is valuable, what we think is good to know. Um, and the, all that is changing before, because we have noticed something very important. I work with a lot of, of scientists. You see a few of my books there <laughs> and there and other books from other scientists. Um, the interesting, interesting thing is, for example, um, if you see the children uh, through the glass of potentials, you will have a big surprise. Because our genetic programs, those who built us, they don't know where and when we will be born. They don't know if it will be 20,000 years ago on the ice or if it will be in 200 years in a desert. Um, the potential needed to survive in those environments are very different, but the genetic programs are the same. So they don't know what they have to prepare us for. So because they can't prepare us for anything because they don't know where we will be born, they equip us, and that's that's the the, 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 the genius ideas idea that they had, they equip us with everything, with absolutely all potential that exists. And so children come to the world being real bumps of potentials because a child can become and can learn everything. We have no disposition, we have no pre preparation. We are able to do, to become and to learn everything. And when you see that, I know that we will lose those potentials because to survive in our countries, in our cities, where we live now, we only need a few, really a few potentials. A, a few of them, of those yeah. infinite <laughs> potentials. We will only need a few of them. All the others will disappear. In the end, what stays is like like a bonsai, <laughs> the bonsai version of humans. And who has the keepers of our potential? Who are the one uh, being able to become and to learn everything? Our children. It means they are not those little things we thought they are. They are giants. Right. And that is for me the point where we should start when we want to know what we need to know. And then there is one more thing I wanted to, 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 to tell about what we should know. We should know that we are not made to learn. Our brain isn't made for learning, isn't made to, to memorize things. Our brain is made, is optimized for solving problems. And because we are not so good at memorizing things, uh, we forget everything that doesn't interest us. If something is not interesting us, it will get in to one ear and get out to the other one. And that is what um, you said before, and thank you for saying it. Um, we can't learn anything, we can't keep it in our mind for a long time. Everyone in the audience, they have forgotten 
80% from what they have been learning as children because it didn't interest them. <laughs> so, and in order to in order to, to, to memorize some information, you need activated emotional with description. If it doesn't interest you, you will never be able to learn it. So we need to know it. And then we need to know one final thing. That's what makes our brain able to learn forever is enthusiasm. And enthusiasm is the biggest, the biggest engine, engine to everything in our lives. And if you allow me, I would love to speak a lot about the enthusiasm because it's the key to everything. Yeah, sure. Sure, uh, we want to have um, one more round of questions at least. And uh, I think that we are not made to be educated and not to be educated in things that we don't care about, especially. <laughs> But um, we are made to solve problems, if I, if I get it right. Uh, maybe what we need is um, more, uh, a more broader definition of, of learning, maybe, not to address the, the way we are we are um, wired to, to live in, in this world. I want to go back to you, Andre, but before I wanted to ask Ana Maria, when you said that it's the end of the factory model in, in the schools, you mean about the way kids are being teached? You, you know, the, the, the chairs, the tables, the stay in your chair right now and for the 45 minutes um, that comes? Or you mean that this is an education which uh, prepare us to get into the market, uh, job market, uh, you know, in order to work and have a salary, etc. What, what do you mean exactly with the factory model? I think it's the, the end of understanding the school or the university or uh, educational place uh, as the only place where you can learn physically. So it's a, it's, a, it's a way of questioning the way we learn, but also what we are learning, when we are learning, and how we are learning. So everything is changing because we understand that we need, for example, some knowledge, basic knowledge, some curriculum, but more integrated, linked to our everyday life to the things that are important for us, that make us enthusiastic, as Andre was saying, but also the methodology, because we need to reinforce, for me, three of the main tools that we have to, uh, as human. First, the brain. We have a brain and our main tool is the capacity to be adaptable. The plasticity of the brain to adapt to different circumstances. And we are given children only one way to see the, 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 the reality, only one way to answer the questions. And we are skipping all the creativity, the curiosity, the capacity to innovate. So the first tool or, or, or yes, a, a strategy that we have to bring into this new kind of um, uh, education is The, the uh, understanding the the neuroscientific uh, uh, vision of the of the brain. The second one uh, are our emotions, as I was saying, mm -hmm. and we have to bring them at the center of the learning process because our emotions give us the opportunity to understand others and understand ourselves, to feel something, to be linked with something else and, and not only a boring subject and also to have the autonomy, the capacity to, to be your own uh, leader of your understanding. And that is very important because we are used to a model that adults and, uh, and, the, and the teachers are always defining the way we have to learn, how we have to learn and how we have to behave. And that is changing. And the last tool, let's say, to be human in, in, in this learning environment are our senses. We are humans and as animals, we learn by testing, seeing, touching, uh, using our curiosity. So that's why it's so important play Uh, the uh, methodologies that are looking as a, as a, as a, as a play, using Lego blocks, um, making prototypes, 
uh, bringing the how to do things into the learning environment. So, because we want, we, we don't need to test and smell everything, <laughs> but we have to integrate our brain, our emotions, and our senses, the whole body. That's why we, we talk about a holistic vision of education. Because it, it's not only it is necessary to have knowledge and to memorize some things, but it's not the end or the, the, the whole idea of education. Right. And that is what is changing, and that is not a factory model. Uh, of a school. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Let's talk about enthusiasm because uh, as a mother, one of the uh, sentences that I'm, I am more afraid of is I am bored. <laughs> Mom, I am bored. I, I, I don't know what to do. I got nothing to do. You know, that happens. Or when they come back to school, from school, people say it was so boring. So let's talk about enthusiasm, Andre, and how is it important? Um, no, we are bored when we are asked to put our focus on some on things that uh, that do not match our enthusiasm. That's where the the boring begins. When we have to concentrate to to do things that do not interest us, that we don't like, that we will rather not want to do or to confront. So that is where, where, where um, boredom begins. And then when we are finally free, for example in the, in the holidays, um, we don't know what to do because it was told to, told to us that um, the things that might interest us, that might uh, 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 make us enthusiastic, are not important, are not relevant. I don't know if that what makes you uh, uh, enthusiastic is um, cleaning the cleaning the, the windows, for example, what could be uh, absolutely wonderful if you love it, if you want to do it because you're enthusiastic. Uh, someone will come and tell you, look, that is not important, that is not interesting, that is not relevant, that is worth being enthusiastic. You should rather be enthusiastic about mathematics or science or learning or things that you are not interested in now. And then you, you learn to give up what you would love, what you, would make you enthusiastic, and you have to confront things that you don't like and that makes you that makes you feel like you are not good you are not good because because you are not enthusiastic about them you can't learn them because your uh, emotional centers are not activated so you can't learn them and the only the only thing you feel is i am bad on it at it and that is some of the most uh, common things you will hear for example i am bad in mathematics and that is such a a uh, horrible sentence because it means look i my person am from being i am bad i have a bad opinion about myself i am bad at mathematics and that is not the right the right sentence the scientifically right sentence would be mathematic doesn't interest me And then we have, we, then, then everything is, is, is easier, is, is lighter, you know, and I couldn't agree more um, on everything what Ana Maria said. Um, the enthusiasm is our native, native state. Children are enthusiastic. If you look at little children, you will see they have a, a, a storm of enthusiasm every two, uh, every second or third minute. That's their rhythm of being enthusiastic. They are enthusiastic about everything because they are open to everything. Because they do not have hierarchies between things. For them, um, uh, like I said, cleaning windows is not more or less than being a doctor or, or, or being a lawyer. You know, they don't think the one is better as the other one. The one is more valuable than the other one. They simply are enthusiastic about what they see and what they discover from the world. So that's our native state, and there there should be no no reason uh, it to end. But it ends the moment learning becomes a, some, becomes a work, a piece of job. If it is a job, if learning is a job, 
you won't like it and you will lose your enthusiasm because you will have to focus on things, as I said, that you are not interested in. And finding our enthusiasm is, I, is, is, isn't, dif isn't difficult, it shouldn't be difficult. We should ask that question that no one asked us, what makes me enthusiastic? But that is not a that is not a, a, a easy question because uh, there is no easy answer about that. Um, but um, the good thing is, if you only he hear once once in your life about that power we have when we are enthusiastic. When we are enthusiastic, we are able to everything. And enthusiasm is not the same thing as joy. You know, from time to time you are enthusiastic and making a lot of efforts like children do when they climb trees or things that are too big to them, too big to them, but they do it because they are enthusiastic. They have that engine inside themselves, you know, and that they, they are able to everything because they are enthusiastic. When you hear about that key that everyone has within himself, you can't lose it. It is only, you know, um, behind curtains, behind behind clouds. But if you hear about it once, and that is what we are currently doing, it's like you would take one corner of those curtains away and have a look at the inner landscape of enthusiasm. And when you had once one look at it, you won't forget it. It would change your life. And it would change the world because enthusiasm is really what would change the world. But we have to get rid of all our concepts and ideas about what is important and what isn't. Because what is important is an enthusiastic person cleaning windows. Not everyone being a lawyer. Thank you, Andrew Stern, for your words. And um, I really appreciate your comments on this uh, panel. I would like to uh, just uh, finish this conversation, which could last a long, long, a lot more. And I think we need more conversations about education. Um, with one minute for each of you, two final comments about uh, the things that you consider the most important to address uh, today. Well, we need to reinforce some abilities that are um, absolutely central for today's demands or challenges. We already know them. They are not new. We need more capacity to communicate, but that doesn't mean to write an email or, or a tweet. That means to connect with others, to have this empathy, to, to really communicate and use a message to influence positively. Also, we need more creativity. That doesn't mean to drop out all the math and the science. Of course not. But we have to integrate. We cannot see the education or the learning process as one side uh, fighting with the other. Our rational part f uh, fighting all the time with our creativity uh, part. So we need more creativity. And we need, of course, critical thinking. We are living in a very complex world with a lot of inequalities, with a lot of uh, differences. And we cannot have a white and black vision of the things. And that's why we need to have the right questions, not only answers, but the right question. And at the end, one of the things that have been more um, clear this time is the capacity to be autonomous, to have our own identity, to build our own to be the best of ourselves. And that is what we call agency, the capacity to, you know, start uh, being your own owner of the learning process. And that means we don't want the adults, the teachers, the parents trying to supervise everything and having all the, the, the answers for the children and let them be more curious. And also it's important to understand technology the way it works, but also the way it impacts. And how can we um, be more, uh, decide the change we want to, to have using that uh, technology? And that's why I, I insist, we don't want to be a second class robot doing what robots, uh, robots do. We want to be first class humans 
uh, that that can design the change using technology. So I want to do what what humans can exactly. can do. <laughs> Thank exactly. you, Ana Maria. Um, Andre, a, a final message. We have just. Uh, a few, a couple of minutes actually, but how would you like to end this panel? I think uh, the time has come to develop a culture of trust. Uh, and, and we didn't have it until now, you know. Uh, every little child heard very soon in their lives, uh, the way you are is not the best. You have to change, you have to make progress. You have to develop, you have to grow. And that is something we hear all our life. I don't know if you, you, you already thought about that, but look, that, that way of saying uh, the way you are is not so good as the way you could be if you would make bigger efforts, that destroys us. <laughs> And that is what we hear our, uh, our whole life. It begins very soon with a question like, does the child sleep all night? No, it doesn't, because no child does it. So. The parents uh, give the child the impression we would love you more if you would sleep more. So it begins like that and it doesn't end any when in your life. It will go on and go on and go on saying, look, I love you, comma, but I would love you more if you would help more in, uh, in the house, if you would help cleaning the dishes. I love you, but I would love you more if you would be better uh, about doing your homeworks. I love you, but I would love you more if you were better in school, and so on and so on. And our whole life is like that. We have to change and to become better persons. And that's an enormous pressure. And the problem is, it is not what we wanted to hear. What we want to hear is something else. And that is a question of, of attitude and not a question of concepts. What we wanted to hear is, I love you because you are the way you are. And that is unconditional trust. And we thought unconditional love would be enough, but it is not. Because unconditional love, I love you, comes with a comma, but. <laughs> So what we really are all looking for, our big nostalgia, is that unconditional trust. I love you because you are the way you are. And it is, I'm sure it is what we, what we are working on, what will change everything. And that is nothing we need to learn, because if we need to learn, it is something more we have to learn and to do and to work on and to change. That is only a change in attitude, and that is very, very easy. It has to be easy. If it isn't easy, run away. <laughs> Andrés Stern, thank you so much for, for being with us thank in you. Congreso Futuro. Ciao, hasta la próxima. My first time in Chile. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Andrés Stern is a musician and an author, and he's uh, the writer of the book, I Never Went to School. And we say um, thanks and goodbye to Ana Maria Raad. She's an anthropologist, and she's been with us today. Thank you. Gracias.